We will continue our discussion of uh, political thinkers, major political thinkers in the history of political thought with Aristotle. Aristotle <coughs> remains one of the giants of political thought, still being referred to even today, of course. Who was Aristotle? Very briefly put, he lived in the same world as Plato did, a world of Greek city-states. And actually he was a disciple of Plato, a pupil of Plato, more precisely. And as all pupils do, he will, of course, take things from Plato, but also turn against him and criticize him. Uh, indeed, the path that Aristotle uh, followed was quite different from Plato's in significant regards, but you will see commonalities. So, let's, let's look at some of the principles, some of the major themes in uh, Aristotle's political thought. And, of course, we will start with this question, uh, and he started with this question, of the pr pursuing order, pursuing meaning. Right? This is political philosophy, in fact, and philosophy, uh, the origin of philosophy. So, so, as you remember from our last discussion, the world of the Greeks, the world of the ancients, actually, not just the Greeks, Mesopotamians, Egyptians, was the way they looked at the world was what I call the cosmological perspective, meaning that everything was part of the cosmos, the gods, the humans, the animals, nature, every phenomenon, right? What, <coughs> what this uh, means is that, well, as I said, we see that this world is this disordered, we see it in nature, we see it uh, in uh, human actions and so on, but we also know that there are principles of order, right? And I mentioned last time, gravity. gravity. Uh, you look at the stars and there is an order to how they move. Mathematics. Uh, but also in ethics, there is an order, there is a good and there is an evil. So otherwise, one could not exist without the, without the other. <coughs> but the, the, the question, the conundrum is where to look to find order, where to look to find disorder. Is everything just disordered? But no, that is contradicted by, uh, by observation, right? I see that there is regularity, there are seasons, there is the moon, there is the stars, and so on. So, Plato, Right? Plato looked, he went from appearances, right, in, the, in the dark of the depths of the cave, and he pushed us, or pointed us, invited us, following Socrates, to get out of the cave, to move from appearance to reality. And the reality, what is reality in this sense? Reality, the world outside the cave, are those things that are permanent, that are not or object to change. Um, not just, these are not mathematical principles, these are the things that underlie, for example, mathematical principles. <coughs> uh, without going further, much, further, much more further into detail, uh, let me just you know, point out that Plato talks about the form of the good, right? It's not a form, but what he, points, what, he uh, what he means by this is that the good as such, right, or being, existence as such, these are permanent things. Permanent things that, for example, all, uh, all things partake in existence. All things exist, right? That's a permanent thing. So these are truths that are deeper than the appearances. And, uh, we live, we were born, we live, we die, but these things remain. It, and they don't depend on our opinion about them, right? The order is out there, right? So Plato tried to, tried to go to these forms, he called them, but they, actually these are just sort of a, uh, permanent things, permanent uh, realities, right? Permanent truth, truths. Uh, Aristotle, however, goes in a different direction. He actually dismisses this, this, this claim to permanence, this, actually this claim to being able to go there, to go out of the cave and shape your form according to the good. And he goes, he goes horizontally, so to speak. Plato went up, Aristotle went horizontally. What do I mean by this? Aristotle was, uh, in many ways, the first natural scientist. He was the first comparative political scientist as well. Uh, comparativist. What he did was, what he went around and observed, observed the world. Right? He went around and observed the world and noticed regularities within the world that he could see. 
Yeah? From animals to plants, and he has books about all of these, <coughs> to, to natural phenomena, and he has books about all of these, to the human soul, to ethics, and he has books about all of these, and to politics, and he has a, books, a, a book called Politics. Right? So, that, it's a different method, it's a different method. However, there are uh, strong uh, commonalities. For, of course, Aristotle will start from the question, uh, or from the object of inquiry that is man. If you want to talk about politics, about the city, you have to talk right, about what is man, uh, what is the best life, and then how should we live together. So what was the picture of man, of the, of the human being, of course, that's what I mean, of course. He would use man, but he meant human being. Uh, the human being, for Aristotle as well, it's his, uh, the, the highest part of the human being, or, the, or the, 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 the part that truly makes him or her a human being, is the rational part. Rational again in the sense of the part that allows us to understand, to know. The other part, the irrational part, without going into further detail, just call it irrational part, these are instincts, um, these are uh, all the mechanisms that keep us alive, the things that we share with animals, right, the instinct, instinctual part, uh, or the, uh, the, 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 the aut automatic parts of our, of our mind and of our organism that we share with plants, right? The fact that cells grow and, and multiply, this is how we grow, right? That we share with the plants, it's not our choice, right? Instincts is in between, are in between these uh, uncontrollable uh, mechanisms and, and reason that we self, uh, share with animals. Animals have some control of cells, right? In any case, there is an irrational part that we share with the other part of living universe, right? And there is a rational part which sets us apart. This rational part meaning the part that of understanding, logos, right? The part that understands, that uh, allows us to know. And again, for Aristotle, just like for Plato, knowing means knowing truth, knowing the good, knowing, right? Knowing what's, what's right and real, which are uh, uh, together, and, and knowing what is not true, right, real, and so on. Right? So, that's one important thing. His picture of the human being you will recognize. The second important thing is the principle of teleology. Teleology, <coughs> which is not theology, different thing. Teleology, what is this principle? And you saw it in Plato's well, I just didn't discuss about it and he doesn't treat it closely. The principle of teleology states that everything and anything in the world has a nature. As you can see in the, you can find the same discussion in your textbook. Everything has a nature, um, <coughs> and because everything has a nature, and the way the way the world works, what puts, you know, what explains all the movement in a way in the world, is that <coughs> everything has a natural end. A natural, by natural, you have to understand what corresponds to the thing's nature. That's what natural is, right? So everything has a nature and. Accordingly, it has a natural <coughs> end. A natural end. Meaning, everything in this universal motion, right, tends towards something, and that goal towards it tends corresponds to what that thing is. Sounds complicated, but it's not. For example, <coughs> a seed, right, a seed. Uh, let's say, um, apple tree seed. The seed of an apple, right, which, from which apple trees grow. Um, or a poplar, or whatever the tree it is, elm. Uh, so a seed, <coughs> a seed of an apple tree, what is its natural end? What is its na nature? Its nature is to be an apple tree. Right? Let, let me use the example with the uh, elm tree, if, if, if that works, or maple tree. Let's say a maple tree, maybe it's better. So the maple tree, what is the nature of that seed of the maple tree? Right? It is to become a tree. Right? The seed, its natural end, is to become a tree. And this, what kind of tree? From this seed, you, you won't get a tiger or a lion or a, you know, a Cadillac. Right? From this seed, you will get something that corresponds with its nature, which is what to be a maple tree seed. Right? 
This is the natural end of a thing. So everything actually in the world has an end that corresponds with its nature, with what it is. Accordingly, <coughs> according, however, this world is, this is the order, right, in the world, this is the order. This is a description of order. However, we know that things are disordered in the world. And this um, seed might go bad. Right? Well, what does it mean it goes bad? What do we mean by bad? Right? It means that it does not reach its natural end. Right? Just like an egg that you, uh, from which you want to have uh, for the chicken, it was a fertilized egg, you want to have chicken, it, it is a bad egg in that sense, right? but it will not become a chicken, even if it's, you know, uh, you take you took care of it and uh, <coughs> the time passed and whatever. So, bad, meaning, you know, the opposite of the good, is any development of a thing that does not fit its natural end. So, suddenly, you will understand then the concept of virtue in Aristotle, because virtue will be this quality of a thing reaching its natural end. Right? A thing reaching its natural end. To give you an example that is not from the natural world, but to understand the connection, right? Uh, let's say there is a, if you've ever taken a subway somewhere, right, in New York or whatever, uh, the natural end, right, of the subway is to take you from a specific stop to the end of the line, right? Again, it's, it's a forced uh, comparison, but just to have you, you know, understand, intuit the, the mechanism here. The virtue, I mean, that metro is a good metro, or subway uh, train, if it takes you from A to B, A to B being its line. It's, you know, it's the right thing. Eh? <coughs> if it doesn't, it's bad. <laughs> and you complain and write blog entries and so on. So, that's the idea of virtue. Virtue is the accomplishment of the natural end of the thing. Right? And the entire world functions on this, the natural world, the order and the disorder. This is why um, uh, Aristotle will also talk about, insist on the idea of the middle. Right? Virtue, many people uh, use this shortcut, saying that virtue is the middle. Now this is, can be very misleading because, you know, just because something is in between doesn't necessarily, right, implicitly mean that it is good virtue. Right? However, what he means by this is that, well, what is this, this line here, this direction, right? It's the direction that corresponds with the nature of the thing. Now, if you deviate from it, okay, if you deviate from it, you can go either too much up or too much down. You can go either in one direction or in the other direction. There's only one direction, basically, that is right. The one that takes you to the natural end. Any deviation, either in the sense of too much or too, too little of it, is an error. Right? In this sense, then, right, the middle, this one, the, natural, the line that leads you to natural end, is in the middle, of too much versus too little. And Aristotle gives the example of human virtues, right? Um, he gives the example of courage as a virtue. Now, courage is a virtue. What, in what way is courage a virtue? Well, courage is a virtue in the sense that it is in the middle or in between too much and too little. Well, what is too much of courage or acting bravely, right? Too much is rashness. What is too little? cowardice. You do too much, or you do too little. But there is a right way of doing it, and that's courage. That's one example of one human virtue towards one specific act. Now you'll see how this connects immediately with the uh, discussion of, uh, political, of the political uh, world, of uh, society, and of the city. Now, uh, back to the idea of what is man. Man is a, man is a rational, he says, animal. A rational animal. He has an animal part, instinctive and so on, so organic, and a rational part which differentiates the human being, which I mean always when I say that, from the irrational part, from the animal part. A rational animal. So, 
The rational part is what truly makes a human being a human being. Similar to Plato, you see. Therefore, let's ask, so what is the right life of man, of the human being? What is the life that corresponds with his or her nature? nature. Well, if the nature of the human being is to be a rational animal, right, you will have, you will need all these components to be satisfied, right? But what is the, which one is the most important? Because if all, all these components have a nature and they pursue their end, you know, you need to, f- to, to eat, to drink, these are the uh, organic parts, the, the <coughs> basic parts, the automatic parts of us that we share with the plants, which need to be fulfilled in order to uh, reach the natural end, which is subsistence, which is existence, life. Every aspect of us has a natural end. However, they're not equal, just like in play with the world equal. This is what makes us truly human beings. This is the higher part. Therefore, the true life of the human being will satisfy all of these, yeah? but foremostly, it has to be a life according to reason. And there are different reasons, types of reason that or logos or understanding or knowledge that Aristotle talks about. There is practical reason, which is, has to do with how to act, which is ethics. There is a theoretical reason and so on. We're not going to go into the detail. However, notice this, that man, human being, is a rational animal and the life that truly uh, fits human being is the life according to reason. Let's take a step further. Well, reason where? Anywhere? I mean, life where? Anywhere? Where do you, how do you uh, emphasize this reason? Well, Aristotle also affirmed strongly that man, human being, is a social animal. A social animal. Which means that intrinsically, human beings need other human beings. And this is not just because we get bored and we can connect on Facebook or you know, Twitter is, is down or something. <coughs> we need other human beings to, in order to become human beings. We need other human beings not just in the sense in which Plato talked about that everybody <coughs> contributes something, someone makes shoes, someone does this and so on, someone is a doctor, someone is a driver, not just in that sense, not foremost in that sense, in the sense that in order to actually become a full human being, just like a seed will have to become a tree, Human beings are such that they need other human beings. And I, uh, I, I think I touched on this last time. Children, you know, they're, you know, like the Jungle Book, the story of Maui. Well, there have been many children who, cases of children, who have got lost as, as, as when they were babies, and they were actually raised by wild animals. Raised by wild animals. Well, guess what? They never became human beings fully. The potential always remains there, but if that potential is not nourished at each stage of the development, and someone, if you know any psychology, Piaget's stages of development of the human being, you, this is, has been you know, studied in uh, psychology, if that baby does not receive the, the particular uh, things at each stage of the development, that baby will never become fully a human being. For example, those feral children, right, the children that were uh, uh, raised by animals, wild children, they never learn to talk, even after they have been reintegrated in a human society. Because they have not acquired, they have not developed that skill at the right time, and and, then it's done. So this is, you know, psychologically (coughs) documented and so on. We need human beings in order to become human beings. And we also need human beings to teach us, to teach us, to educate us. Meaning to use reason in to use our capacity to know, to understand, in real life, in life. For example, in ethics. Ethics is something you learn and you become an ethical person, Aristotle says, by doing. You practice it and you do it and you do it and you learn it from others who have done it. The best way of learning this is not necessarily, is not going to, for the form of the good, as Plato said, according to Aristotle, right, he's criticizing Plato, he says it is by learning from others. But there is a good and there is some, uh, an error, right? Because things have a nature. Okay? A, a ch- uh, someone who, a fer- feral child, never became a real human being, a full human being, a full human being. 
in that sense. So, we need, and I, you know, for Aristotle, for the Greeks, we need the city to become fully human beings. And in fact, for the Greeks, there was no such thing as the human being, by the way. The. We have this idea that there is this compact category, nicely framed, of the human being. That's not, that's not how they looked at it. The human being, or um, being human rather, was something on a sliding scale. Something on this sky sliding scale. Meaning that you can be anywhere in this realm of possibilities from beasts, which were the uh, tribes the outside the Greek city-states in the, in the forest, uncivilized, uneducated, they didn't have the art, the culture, the, the education, the, 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 the literature that the Greeks had. Uh, beast, they called them, he called them. Or you can be a god, he said. Obviously nothing but a, what we today use in the term of god, but in the sense of someone who is more than a human being. You can, slide, you can be on this sliding scale, but human being is here. Human being is here. This is where you, and human being is not only here because he, uh, the human being needs the city, but because this is kind of, this is in a way, the place of human flourishment. Because a human being, to be a full human being, needs to be active, needs to be engaged society, needs to be part of uh, the social life, or the civic life, to be part of the ethical life of the city, fully engaged citizens, sort of a thing, idea, image. So, <clears throat> but how about the philosophers? They don't, you know, Socrates went around and of course he did his part in the city and so on. Well, this is the full human being, but Aristotle says that the highest life, right, one is the best life. The full life is this in the city, and he was there with the rest of the Greeks who thought uh, similarly. Um, but the highest life was life, again, according to what is highest in the human being, which is what? Reason. Reason, understanding. So the highest form of life, the epitome of life, is a life of contemplation. And this doesn't mean just watching the moon and the stars and sitting out, outside, uh, you know, wasting time. Contemplation in the sense of an active life of the mind. A life in which we exercise the highest part of us. A life of knowledge, of pondering, of studying, of understanding, of developing the highest in us. Obviously someone who is here in the middle of the hustling and the bustling of the city, uh, very involved in the civic life, he doesn't, or she doesn't have the time to do this. This is why the highest life is a life of leisure. Leisure, again, not in the sense of wasting time and eating ice cones, which is not, nothing bad about that. But <coughs> it, in, it is in the sense that contemplation needs time. Time to think, meditate, combine things, allow things to come to the fore, look for them. It's not something you can do between 5.10 and 5.15 in the morning. This is the highest life, actually. This is the best, the life is most accustomed. But not everybody is ready for this, not everybody is fit for this, not everybody will do it, but Aristotle has to deal with it, and so he talks about the life of contemplation. But the full life of the most of the human beings is here in the city, in the society. Now, how should this society be organized politically? <coughs> well, first of all, what is politics? What is the purpose of politics? We didn't necessarily cover this because, of course, these are just introductory sessions. I invite you to read. I invite you to read Plato and Aristotle. And you feel free to, to, to approach me um, with questions, <coughs> even later, in, you know, a few months from now. Um, what is the purpose of politics? The whole discussion in the Republic started from the question, what is justice? And what is justice was answered by different partners in the conversation based on what they thought politics was. Right? So someone said, as you've seen other authors, uh, Chastimachus is the character in the Republic who says this, you know, it's all about power. And you remember from uh, your discussion online, this comes up right, often. Right? It's all about power. But Plato's, Socrates' argument in Plato's Republic was, well, that is truly, yeah, indeed what some people do. But are they rulers? 
Each thing has a nature and has what it fulfills is that nature it is truly what it should be. So what is the nature of a ruler? What is what makes someone a ruler? Not exercising power. What is the essence of rule? And <coughs> you know, in the Republic, Plato talks about, uh, let's say, a shoemaker. Well, if a shoemaker, you ask for, you pay him for a shoe, and he makes you an ice cone, as we talked about, you will probably talk, consider him either crazy or not a good uh, shoemaker. Right? Or he makes you uh, uh, shoes that do not fit, or or he rips you off. He takes your money and gives you something that only resembles a sock, not a shoe. <clears throat> well, what just happened? That shoemaker maybe exercised his power to obtain profit 